send our children to school, we need to know that they're going to be taught in science class about evolution. That is the scientific consensus of how life on this earth came about. It came about over millions and billions of years, and if you go back far enough in time, you get to the Big Bang about 13.8 billion years ago. Now, of course, this theory of, disagrees with the Bible account of creation found in Genesis 1. We studied about that back in June in a sermon that I titled, This is My Father's World. If there is one thing I can agree with the evolutionist on is this, and Jeff alluded to us in our class this morning, the theory of evolution in the creation account of Genesis 1 cannot both be right. And those who try to marry the two begin to look more foolish with each passing year based on the contortions they have to make to scripture to try to fit the ever-changing theory that we have in science. But the fact that children will be learning evolution in schools is one thing, but because they are, and because it's going to be presented to them as established fact, that means as parents and grandparents, we must be vigilant in teaching children why the, their science textbook is wrong, where the Bible is right. Now you might ask, why is it really that important to teach the, the kids this way? Is it really something I need to invest my time in? Well, we must realize that if the Bible isn't true in any part, it casts doubt on the entire book. After all, Genesis 1 is the very first words. If God can't tell us the truth in the very first chapter of the Bible, why should I go to the rest of the book and think that it can tell me truth as well? The Bible claims to be the infallible, meaning the perfect word of God. It claims to be this from this God. And if this God is not smart enough to tell humans, you know, I did it this way, you evolved from animal. You evolved from uh, simpler life forms. It took me over millions of years to do it. Could God have done that? Absolutely, He could have done that. That's not what He said He did, though. And it, the Bible teaches that the, as the Bible says that it came from God. Claims to be God's own word. Second Peter one verse twenty one would tell us that this is the mind of God. The holy men of God were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so the Bible claims this is God's own words. This is not an invention of man. And the Bible claims to be complete and truly able to equip us to all good works. So if Genesis is untrue, if Genesis is false, then those in the Bible who referred to it are one of two things. They were either fooled by it for their lives. That's because Jesus, David, Paul, Peter, all quote from the creation account. All base their theology on the creation account. Jesus, in Matthew 19, and verses 4 to 6, what did he base his teaching on divorce and remarriage from? The creation of Adam and Eve. He said, in the beginning it was not so because God made man, he made woman, and for this reason, father shall leave, or sorry, son shall leave father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two become one flesh. Jesus was quoting from Genesis chapter 2, which was the continuation of Genesis 1. Jesus was mistaken or lying if Genesis is untrue. Paul's explanation of why women are not to hold authority over men in 1 Timothy 2, 12-15, what was that based on? The creation of Adam and Eve. Adam was formed first, then Eve. Eve was deceived and was in the transgression. That's why, that's how Paul based his teaching there. 
If Genesis 1 to 3 is wrong, there would be key teachings in the scripture. And this is uh, missing. And this is why trying to marry the two is foolish. Because you're going to remove these teachings from the scripture by doing that. Where does man have a soul? Well, Christians believe that he does. A lot of religious people believe we have a soul. And even though we have not seen it, we know that we are different than the animals. Animals are alive, but they do not have the spirit made in the image of God. What makes us different? It's not it. Yes, our biology makes us different, but as far as the chemical elements that are in our body, they are different than the animals, but they contain the same elements. Carbon and water and nitrogen and, and, and all, all of these other elements that are in our body. We can come along and say, well, it's DNA's there. You have DNA in animals. You have DNA in humans. What makes us different? It's We're made in the image of God, our spirit. Genesis 1 to 3 is wrong. The fact that men were without sin but fell into it is missing as well. Because Adam and Eve were placed in the Garden of Eden, told, don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. That's a story tied to creation. Whereas if man evolved, that's a story that would be missing. Moreover, the power, they're showing us the power of God. God's power is sometimes rooted in the fact of his creation. As I said earlier, God could have made man any way he wished. It would not make him less powerful. But what, what grounds his power is his ability for him to tell the truth. People come along and say, well, man wasn't ready for the truth back in Abraham's day or back in Moses' day. After all, they didn't have cell phones, they didn't have computers, they didn't have this, they didn't have that. But this earth stands for another thousand years, two thousand years, five thousand years. What will people in the future think about us? Would they think we were just so primitive that we, we did, they didn't have what we have? Mathematics, which is what we base all of our physics and all of our understanding. Where did it come from? It didn't come in the 19th century or the 20th century. The applications did. But the mathematics comes from the Greeks and the Romans who lived before Christ. The Pythagorean theorem that people read or the people learn in math comes from Pythagoras, who was Greek. Didn't live in the 1800s, 1700s. He lived before Christ. The pyramids are shown to be mathematically uh, sound as far as how they're built and how they're oriented. Mankind was smart. Mankind could have been told something if it was true. God never kept from mankind that which was true. And so if God made man by evolution, but then lied to him, how can we claim that he is the powerful God? He says he is, and he cannot even tell us the truth about how he made us. And then, of course, another key teaching is about the need for salvation. You take away the cause of sin, you also take away the need for salvation, and really that's the crux of people wanting to, so hard for evolution to be true, is so that they can take away that teaching. It takes away, they think, the need to obey God. It doesn't actually take it away because we can't do that, but they believe it does, and they give themselves justification as why they are not going to obey. So let's quickly deal with Oh, I didn't get that. Must not put that in. Let's quickly deal with Genesis chapter 1. We're not going to reread it. We've read it before. This is going to be our summary of what Genesis 1 talks about. In the first five verses, we find day one of creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We saw the creation of the universe, the creation of the world, the earth, and the creation of light. That was day one. In verses six to eight, we find the events of day two, which was merely the creation of the Earth's atmosphere, dividing the waters above the heavens and the waters below the heavens. You could come along and say, well, where'd water come in? It would have come in day one, day two, somewhere in there. But the creation of the atmosphere is day two. 
Day three is found in verses 9 to 13. That was the creation of dry land that came up out of the waters. And then once dry land appeared, vegetation on the land was day three. Day four is found in verses 14 to 19. It's the creation of the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, anything that we find in our sky, comets and asteroids and, and all of these other things that we see in our sky, that would have been day four. Verses 20 to 23 is day five with the creation of fish and birds. Um, and then day six, which is the end of the chapter, verses 24 through the beginning of chapter two, verse one, we have day six which the creation of anything that walks on land, and then last of all, humans made in the image of God. Now scientists love to come along and claim to have shown that Genesis 1 cannot possibly be true because they say what? The earth came about in the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago, and it was the Big Bang that, ever, that, that eventually led to stars and galaxies and eventually, it, it, when you, the conditions for life. And once we had the conditions for life, we had life on this earth, and it evolved from simple to more complex life forms over a period of about four and a half billion years. And if you're wondering what that number is, that's the approximate age that they figure the earth is, about four and a half billion years. Doesn't mean that life immediately started on earth, four and a half billion years ago, but the conditions for life uh, gradually over that four and a half billion years, we, we got liquid water and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, we got life. That's the claim. Now to claim such as proven fact and not taken on faith based on the interpretation of the evidence that they have is the ultimate form of hubris or pride. Because we were not there. In Job 38, let's read verses 1 to 11 of Job 38. Job 38, beginning at verse 1. And the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurement? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were the, its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Or who shut in the seas with doors when it burst forth and issued from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and the thick darkness its swaddling band. When I fixed my limit for it and set bars and doors. When I said, this far you may come, but no farther. And here your proud waves must stop. And you can continue on uh, with God's speech to Job. Basically, he was asking Job is, you think you're so smart? Tell me how I did this, seeing as how you were not there. And of course, Job couldn't answer that. The fact remains is, I will readily admit that I accept Genesis chapter 1 based on faith. It's not a blind faith. It is a faith that is based on evidence that I have seen in this world, which shows obvious signs of a designer. My faith is built in God, who has kept his promises all the way along, both in blessings and cursings. My faith is in a book that is consistent with itself, even though it was written over a period of about 1,500 years, and has been vindicated time and time and time again when mankind has actually proven something. And since it has been vindicated on the things we can see, I can accept it on the things that we cannot see. Because God, who was there, relayed to us the information. I use the same evidence to teach creation that the evolutionists use to teach evolution. And yes, I do so through my belief in creation. But I try to do so fairly. I try not to step out on limbs that I cannot uh, defend. I try to do so humbly, noting that God hasn't given us all knowledge, nor has he revealed all things to us. And there might be some things I cannot answer. And that's okay. Because on the whole, my faith is not placed in, can I answer every question? Because that will shake our faith. If I have to 
come along and say, well, I don't understand that. And since I don't understand that, that must mean it's all wrong. We don't do that in any other field of knowledge that we have. That we come along and say, if it doesn't answer all my questions, I cannot believe it. If we did that, we would go nowhere. We would not be flying around this earth on airplanes. We would not have cars. We would not have computers or anything like it if we have to fully understand absolutely everything about it. The Bible is consistent. The Bible has been proven to be right about things it talks about. And if there are things that I can't quite understand, well, I trust in God who I place my faith in. But, and that's what I asked of the evolutionists, that they were not there, that they take a dose of humility and be willing to accept that they too are following after faith, but a faith in the absence of God. But just because there are some things I cannot answer, that doesn't mean that I should be just accepting that, well, we can't possibly know on things that we can so there are some claims that evolutionists make that they say prove evolution. There are too many of them to cover in this lesson. We only have about 15 to 20 minutes left. And so what I'd like us to cover is the main ones that a lot of children will hear in school and try to show you from the scriptures what the Bible's explanation to those things are. And so the first thing we're going to talk about is the age of the earth. Now, the age of the earth uh, has been dated using various radiometric dating to be about four and a half billion years old. I will make a point here. For evolution to be true, the earth has to be that old. Because we do not see evolution by natural selection in our, we don't observe it in our society today. And if we don't observe it today, if it hasn't happened in our lifetime, then for it to have the possibility of happening, it's got to be on such a large time scale that we can just come along and say, well, it happened in the past, we just don't see it now because we're, we're so focused on the here and now. But if you broaden out your scope, then it would happen. The earth has to be that old in order for evolution to be true. In my lifetime, though, I'm 38 years old, the age of the world has changed significantly over that time. And so now scientists will claim, yeah, we have better technology, leading to better precision, leading to different numbers. But I do note that just because something is measured today doesn't mean that the measurement is correct. Because after all, measurements and measurement systems can be proven to be wrong because the age of the earth has changed in my lifetime. We found out, oh, well, this was wrong or that was wrong because our measurements are, you know, when we talk about geology, not like to taking out a meter stick or a tape measure and measuring something that we can see. It's using something that, it's using a way of measurement that has a lot of assumptions built into it in order for it to be able to spit out the numbers that it spits out. The way that the age of the Earth is, is calculated, for those who don't know, I said it was radiometric data. Basically, without you know, I'm a chemistry major, and so I could go into the science of it, but I'm not going to. Basically, what it is is a measure of the change of one element into another element through radioactive decay. When we often think of radioactivity, we think of nuclear reactions, uranium and, and plutonium and things like that. Well, the reason why we have nuclear reactions is because of this decay, and this decay will produce energy. Uranium will decay into lead. Potassium will de decay into argon. You don't need to remember that. You just need to remember, OK, what we're talking about is a change. And so what the science textbooks, though, will rarely tell you, and scientists though will say it to be, it is true, is that their measurements are based on certain assumptions which have to be true in order for the calculations to be correct. What are these assumptions? Well, the assumption number one is that radioactive decay is at a constant predictable rate uh, that, 
that we, we can therefore know. Thing is, we've only known about radioactivity for 125 years. It was discovered in 1896. We didn't know it existed. And so we're going to come along on 125 years worth of knowledge and say that the rates of decay have been the same forever and ever and ever. That's our assumption. If those rates change, our calculations are off. Either we're calculating too young or we're calculating too old. A rate changes. So in other words, even if you have a car, you think about driving down the highway. When you say I'm going 100 kilometers per hour, that is a rate of change of distance. A rate per something. If you go 100 kilometers an hour, you will travel 100 kilometers in one hour. If you change your rate to 90 kilometers an hour, you will go 10 kilometers less. If you speed up to 110 kilometers an hour, you will go 10 kilometers more. You can see rates change. Our measurements change too. Assumption number two is that the materials contained in the sample that we're measuring have not changed. Nothing was added. Nothing was removed that we're measuring. However, we know that rainwater leaches uranium, which means it washes away. Argon gas, you know, argon is a gas, that freely moves through the Earth's crust. Things get added and removed all the time. And the thing is, we were not there. We have to build an assumption in there that there is no change. That what we see today is what was there in the beginning. Which leads, leads us to assumption three, which was when we started, when we had that sample started, it was all uranium. There was no lead in the sample. Because if there was lead in the sample, that means that whatever we're measuring for lead didn't all come from the uranium. Throw off our dates. We would be measuring too old. And so these three assumptions have to be valid. But we cannot, there's no way to prove any of them are valid because we were not there. People come along and say, but the Earth looks old. It just looks old. Take a look at all the rocks out there. Take a look at erosion and weathering, and, and you, you take a look at some of the wonders of the Earth. And I think it goes back to an assumption that we make on Genesis chapter 1. Now, something I'd like you to consider. In Isaiah chapter 64, verse 8, we read, But now, O Lord, you are our Father, we are the clay, and you are the potter, and we are all the work of your hand. Now, there's nothing about creation in there, but there's a, a, a figure of speech, a clay, the clay and the potter. When a potter sits down to make something, they don't put the clay, the clay on the on the the table, and all of a sudden get a vase. They have to mold it. They have to shape it. When we read Genesis chapter 1, we read, God created light, said there, let there be light, and there was light. And we believe, okay, it happened like that, and it could have. I'm not saying it didn't. Because God can create any way. But God always seems to work in creation when he is creating things. He can work instantaneously, but he can also work methodically but do so in a way that doesn't obey our laws. We are making an assumption that the laws of nature have always been the same and you cannot break the laws of nature. When God said let there be light what did it look like? We were not there. God, I believe everything we see in the sky when you take a telescope out and see all these wonders actually did happen. But that God creating this universe ready for mankind can do things in a way that will break our times. God is a spirit. God is God. Can he speed up light faster than the speed of light? If he can't, he's not God. Can he, when, when the dry land appeared out of the, out of the waters, were there mountains? Yes, there had to have been mountains created because we know there were mountains in Genesis chapter 7, during the flood. 
did God did did the water the dry land rise out of the waters with all the elevations that we see? Could have. God could have said it, and it was so. But He also could have brought the land out of the ocean and molded the rocks the way we see it. Well, would that show weathering? You betcha. It would. It, God would use the processes that He created to change this earth. God made this earth. That's that's the point. God made this earth ready for man. He made this earth with the materials needed for man to survive. We often look at people. I've looked out at people in this audience, and I can't tell how old most people are. Sometimes I might think they're older than they are. Sometimes I might think they're younger than they are. We can get fooled just by looking at something and using our senses to try to determine how old it is. Our biases can seep into our science if we're not careful. If something confirms our bias, we'll announce it loudly and proudly. If it doesn't confirm our bias, we try to sweep it under the rug, not address it, or downplay it. There's a lot of assumptions that go into radiometric dating that even if one of them was wrong, our measurements would be wrong. We were not there. We cannot test our assumptions. And therefore, when it comes to the age of the earth, the scientists may believe they've proven it, but the Bible says otherwise. We come along, what about fossils? Bible says that you, you, we dig up fossils all the time. The presence of fossils, though, pose no threat to believing in the Bible. Fossils, if you don't know, have been found on every continent of this planet, including Antarctica. Fossils were everywhere. Because animals were everywhere. But there is an explanation from the Bible as to why they are there. Before mankind ever needed an explanation as to why they were there. The flood of Noah's day is what could have produced the fossils that we see. Fossilization requires a quick burial and much water. In, 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 otherwise, scavengers would come along and eat the animal and decay the, decay the, the, the bones and everything else even when it's exposed to air and we have nothing left. To dust we are, to dust we shall return. But you give it a quick burial in much, in much water, and it's preserved. Maybe not the bones itself, but the imprint of them. And we have the fossils to show that they were alive. But what we do find in Scripture uh, is, or sorry, what we do find in the fossil record is no evidence of transitional forms. And what, what I mean by that is, if evolution is true, you go from one animal, and slowly over time, you evolved it into a different animal. It doesn't happen that you're this animal one day and this animal and the next day. It have, would have to happen over time. And so we should see fossilization of all of these different transitional figures. We don't find them in the fossil record. We always find a distinction between species, a distinction between animals. Never these transitional forms. But then we have what some think it's the Achilles heel of Genesis, which is what about the geologic column? You know, you see all these layers and layers of, of dirt that has risen over time, and we have all these fossils, and at the bottom you got all these small animals, simple life forms. And then you get more complex and more complex as you go along, and we always see that. More complex until you get to the present day. Why if, if Creation was right in the flood, created all of those fossils. Wouldn't you just expect to see mixtures here and there? Wouldn't, is that what you expect to see? First of all, we do need to realize that the geological column only appears in textbooks. Each continent has its own, and they're not uniform across the planet, though there are some similarities. And that, again, would be consistent with a worldwide flood. But this is supposed evidence of evolution because of the bias towards millions and millions of years. And what this has done is it caused us to associate the progression of fossils as a sign of time periods when these animals li lived. However, the Bible again, through the worldwide flood, tries a, another explanation, which we must consider. Animals 
when, when we read Genesis chapter 7, we say, okay, the rain came down. Noah was in the ark with all the animals. Rain came down, flood the earth. And it's just very easy to think. The flood waters, there were no flood waters on the first day. And on the second day, there were tons of flood waters. And everybody died on the second day. No. It said it took 40 days and 40 nights for the earth to be flooded with water up to the tallest mountains. Everybody didn't die on the first day or on the second day or on the third day. Why? Because animals, and humans for that matter, are intelligent beings. Your habitat gets ruined, you keep climbing until you can climb no more. So you would expect to see animals and life forms at the bottom of the geological column that couldn't do that. Simple life forms. You would expect to see more complex life forms the further up you go. And God, in, uh, when you start adding as much water as we're talking about in Genesis 7, you're going to start layering more and more and more sediment, more and more and more dirt, and you're going to kill more and more and more animals. Thus, the geological column doesn't represent millions of years of evolution from simple to more complex. It represents when animals were buried during the worldwide flood of Noah's day that drastically changed the look of this planet and where these animals live in relation to where they died in the flood. Fossils in the geological column isn't the enemy of the Christian. They can be used, they can be, sorry, his friend in actually making sense of the Bible stories or if such stories are true, we would expect to find exactly what we found. And then finally, let's deal with evolution itself. What about evolution? Doesn't the evidence show that species do evolve over time? After all, you're going to read about Darwin's finches and the beak changes and how that's proof of evolution. It used to be in textbooks that they were, when they, when they talked about evolution, what they were talking about was Evolution by natural selection, meaning the change of one species to another. That's what the textbook used to say. And then when it came to changes within a species, so in other words, changes in eye color, changes in hair color, changes in different types of features, like as far as the length of your jaw and things like that, those were called adaptations or variations. Now, what our textbooks have done, or sorry, the... Uh, well, I guess I, I guess I put that all up on one. What ne now textbooks do is they try to blend evolution and adaptation. Evolution by natural selection is now called macro evolution, whereas adaptation or variation is now called micro evolution. Macro meaning big, micro meaning small. And I think this change was on purpose. For adaptation can be seen in nature. We see that all the time. Darwin's finches are an example of it. So what the scientists are trying to do is trying to say, ah, you do believe in evolution. You believe in microevolution. Well, if microevolution is true, here's this other evolution is also true. That's what they're trying to do. What they'll call macroevolution has never been seen in nature. Adaptation has. We do have DNA structures that enable us to change. We know it from genetics. You have children. Your children will inherit parts of your traits from both parents. Some will inherit hair color, eye color, all these other different features you inherit from your parents. Just because you have two parents that have one color eyes doesn't necessarily mean your children are going to have those color eyes because you each carry two genes. And maybe your child gets the genes that don't create those color eyes. They create something else, adaptation. And over time, animals can adapt to their habitat. But they have a DNA to do that. But for evolution by natural selection to be true, sometimes it's, called, it's dubbed survival of the fittest. Each of these intermediary forms of animals which cannot be found, must be fully functional. Talking about uh, each, sorry, each intermediate form must be better than the prior. 
And, but the problem with that is we have numerous systems in our body which are not reducible. What I mean by that is each part of the system is dependent on another part. Take a look at your digestive system. Your digestive system isn't just your stomach. Your digestive system involves your mouth, your teeth, your tongue, your esophagus, your small intestines, your large intestines, and all of the other things that go into it as well to give you the hormones and the chemicals and everything you need to digest. One piece is missing. Just ask some people who are missing parts of their digestive system. Ask them how it's going. They're going to tell you it's a big difference. We might be able to live missing certain parts, but we can't live without certain parts either. We won't live. That's true of the reproductive system, the nervous system. When it comes to blood and blood clotting, all of these things would have had to evolve because these simple animals didn't have all these things. They would have all had to evolve at once. And that's not what our textbook teaches us. Even though when you take a look at the simplest life forms, such as bacteria or even viruses, we've been talking so much about viruses the last two years, even these are complex and extremely complex. Even they have systems that if you take one part away, they die. Thus, to say that evolution by natural selection solves our problems and makes God unnecessary to explain life, we know is a lie. People have been fooled and deceived by the devil, by other men and women, into walking away from God. And this has led to all of the other atrocities we see today. Why is abortion acceptable? Because we don't value life. Why is homosexuality seen as acceptable? Because really, who cares? If, God, if there is no such thing as a God, there's no, there's no one to tell me that I can't be engaged in a relationship with whomever I want. And if you don't think it can get worse, it will get worse as time goes on if we continue walking farther and farther away from God. In closing then, there might be a que question that people ask. Why then does God allow us to be deceived? If creation in Genesis 1 is correct, why does he allow the evidence to also point to this other, other solution? Well, the answer is he gave us free will. He allowed Eve to be deceived. He gave Eve the law, allowed Satan to tempt her, and he didn't force Eve to obey. He allowed her to be deceived. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, in verses 1 to 5, Moses was quoting God here. In verse 1, every commandment which I give you today, you must be careful to observe that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers. And you shall remember that the Lord your God led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you and test you, to know what was in your heart, whether you should keep his commandments or not. So he humbled you, allowed you to hunger, and fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he, make, that he might make you know that man shall not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. Your garments did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell these 40 years. You should know in your heart that as man, a man chastens his son, so the Lord your God chastens you. I thought the children of Israel were in the wilderness because they rebelled against God. They were. They rebelled against God and not taking the promised land. But God used that as a test. Are you going to follow me or not? He tested them with hunger to see if they would finally realize that they need to depend on him. Well, God tests us in many ways. If he want, how, are, how is he going to know if we will walk in faith? We learn that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Do we believe in God or not? The fossil record and all other evidence we unearth can properly be explained by the Bible where the Bible speaks on the topic. But it, it can be incorrectly explained by the devil, who is tempting us to leave God and deny his existence. 
God does not always make us believe in him. Psalms 14 verse 1 says, though the fool has said there is no God. Only the fool says that. Because the wonders of creation demand a creator. Now, before we close, let's not take away a lesson that I'm not teaching. And that is science is wrong in all cases. Let's not take away that lesson. Things can be proved, whether it's in medicine, chemistry, physics, biology, astronomy, or climatology. Scientists are not always wrong. But we do need to consult the evidence from reliable sources, not just someone who claims to be knowledgeable on the internet. And we must be humble enough to ask for help in understanding things that are too technical when we get confused by people who are educated in science, but also are a Christian. I would trust a Christian who has knowledge on a scientific topic 10 times out of 10 before I'll go to YouTube or some other internet site and trust a person I do not know. I trust that a Christian will tell me the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yes, Christians can be wrong. I'm not saying that they're perfect. But when I have a choice of believing a Christian who has knowledge on the topic and believing a person I have no idea who they are, I'll believe the Christian every time. The Bible teaches that God did create this universe in six days, that mankind fell into sin and needs to be saved through Jesus. The question is, will you place your trust in God and be saved by him? Or will you place your trust in the world, gamble with your life, in the hopes that he doesn't exist. I'm not ashamed to own my Lord, nor to live.